Hello. Kaya Wanju. Hello and welcome to the Art Gallery of Western Australia. My name's Isabel Wise. I'm the curator for this exhibition. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the Wajak Noongar people, the traditional owners of the land where we're gathered here today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I feel very fortunate to live and work on uh, Wajak Noongar country um, and work with this incredible collection that is owned by everyone in this state. Um, today, I am joined by three artists from this exhibition. John Teschendorf, whose work is Root Fragment of a Larger System from his History of Ideas Series 3. His is a large, kind of at a distance, almost monochrome painting, but it has these uh, diagonal lines sort of almost pushing up through the black, um, like it's sort of kind of emerging from the surface of the work and pushing out past the canvas. And Joe Derbyshire, whose work, um, Fair Winds, Mariner's Farewell, which is over behind us here. And Lindsay Harris, whose painting, Mukuru, Wettest Part of the Year, is on the back wall over here. And it has the horizontal um, natural pigment lines through it with an oval in the center. Um, before we dig into a con good conversation with these artists, um, I'll tell you a little bit about this this show. Um, it is quite an expansive exhibition on abstraction. It has 97 works by 68 different artists in this exhibition. So this conversation today will be kind of a small focused part of um, quite a larger conversation that's happening between artworks around us. Um, in pulling together this exhibition, I found myself in kind of looping thoughts and repeated conversations with colleagues and artists around um, the expansiveness of abstraction, the expansiveness of thinking about what art from a particular place might be, what the state of Western Australia might be, um, sort of became this ever expanding idea of what could be made possible through an exhibition about abstraction. Um, a question that would come up over and over again from artists was, are you talking about abstract art or abstraction? Are you talking about art, about the processes and ideas of making art? So like we might see in Carl Wiebke's work around the corner or Trevor Bickers at the front, these ideas that are unpacking processes of making in art. Um, and I thought, no, 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 I'm thinking about art that is non-figurative and quite open to different ideas that can happen through the medium of an object whose purpose, or that purpose is art. So I limited myself to works that are non-figurative, um, made by artists who don't necessarily exclusively make work in the field of abstraction, but when they do, it's sort of from a point of understanding that um, might come from many different ways of thinking. And the artists that I've sort of brought together today, I was in, uh, interested in, um, in each of their work, there's ideas about um, personal histories as well as processes of making um, ideas of materiality or place. So there's a lot of different um, positions that their work might be coming from. Um, and I was in, always had good conversations with the two people who I've had conversations with previously on this panel and I was intrigued to talk to Lindsay as well, who I've only met in person for the first time today. Um, I'm gonna start with, I think Joe. I'll start with, if that's all right. Um, I first saw Joe's work, I was talking to her before about first encountering her work in the state buildings over near um, St George's Terrace and it was hanging there um, with Art Collective WA have a space that they show work there um, with a partner piece from this same series. And it had quite um, an immediate impact on me. Um, I'm familiar with Joe's work. Um, I've enjoyed the way that Joe can couple uh, histories of place and personal histories and um, somehow connect that through an object of end her making. 
Um, and that seemed to sort of rise through in this work. And when I first saw it, I didn't know why it was working for me, and maybe I still don't know why. I learned more about where it came from and what the ideas were in it. Um, but are you able to tell us a little bit about some of those ideas and processes of making chocolate? Sure. Thanks, Isabel. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm very thrilled and honoured to be in this exhibition with so many amazing West Australian artists. It's, it's, it's really amazing. Um, I made the work uh, after my father died in 2018, and he was a sailor, and he would take us... Our whole childhood was spent on boats, and he would take us to Karnak Island, Garden Island and Rottnest Island and we would live on the boat and I had a lot to do with water, which actually inspired a lot of my artworks, the snorkelling and the idea of what's underneath the water. So when he died about uh, eight months later, we, our family went out on a boat and we took his ashes out to sea uh, to a place, a, a passage called Hugel's Passage or Challenger Passage, which is between... Karnak Island and Garden Island and it was very deep water there and it was a magical day. It was absolutely incredible. Um, the water was very calm and it was sort of moving like this but it was, it was like glass and we put his ashes into the water and then we threw flowers over onto the water as well and because there was no wind or current it sort of just stayed around the boat and then, in honour of my dad, our whole family jumped in the water with him. So we swam in the water and it was like swimming for me, it was like swimming in jewels. The colour was just amazing. And uh, when I got home, I thought, OK, I'd love to make um, a painting about that day and that feeling of being in the water. And for me, abstract art is, is not conceptual about processes. It, in a sense, it's more about what is the feeling that I am trying to embody here, and in fact, it was a it was a um, a feeling that I experienced with my own body of being in a kind of jewel, like a sapphire or um, a marine kind of colour, and uh, so I started to work on three pieces. And I work a lot with, or I always work with oil paint because of the transparent colours. And so that when you do layers and layers of transparent colours, you can achieve this very watery effect, the kind of crystallisation of water. And so I worked, I, I, I played around for a while and painted on, t on top of um, a couple of other paintings. And what I realised was that the particular greens I was working... There's about six different greens in there, but they're all transparent. And so they enabled me to get a sense of depth because while the water was beautiful on the top and transparent, underneath was very deep and dark. And I think that experience is also a metaphor for death and grief... Um, and even when someone like my dad, who had a great life, you know, um, it, it, it's still sad. It's still a, a kind of a deeper feeling that no one can really explain. So I was very happy with the three works. The titles of them I gave about the Mariner's Farewell is a poem that is traditionally spoken when someone's ashes are scattered at sea or a body is um, delivered to the water at sea. And so the three paintings, um, were, the titles were taken from sentences within that poem. Yeah. Thank you, Jo. That's fantastic. Um, Jo's done um, a number of works throughout her career that relate to underwater environments um, and how they might be a space where you can talk about um, personal histories or broader histories of place within um, those environments. And um, I've always enjoyed how there's this feeling of being both on top of the water and looking into it, but also in it at the same time, and that really is present in this work. Um, and this, it has this tension of um, being quite energised, but also cleansing um, and... Yeah, it does something for me. Um, and it's sort of hanging in here amongst 
um, works that are doing similar things in terms of natural spaces, but also um, ideas of water being a cleansing environment. So George Haynes has done a number of works that are pools for certain people. This one's a pool for Rothko, and he painted it after Rothko died. Um, so this idea that water might be um, a place where you can kind of release grief into, um, it pops up in other spaces in this show as well. Um, Lindsay, I first saw your work when um, I was in our collection storage facility, two stories down from here, and I looked at hundreds of works of art for this exhibition, um, being with the works and kind of having an understanding of how they might, what they might stir in me and what I might feel or what my body might do while around them was really important. So while you're kind of placing pictures on a screen while curating an exhibition, spending time with the actual object was really important for me. So I, our paintings conservators and objects conservators sort of came through the stores with me and while they looked at an object being exhibition ready, I thought about those objects in relation to myself, other works in the show, the history of art here, and all sorts of other um, ideas. And I saw Lindsay's work, um, there's another work by Lindsay in the collection, um, but when I pulled this rack out, um, I had the day before been looking at Elsa van Keppel's textile work, and Elsa, her work is round the corner there, and Elsa would go on these long walks in nature and gather materials from um, the environment to dye her fabrics and then make these um, incredible textile works. And it instantly kind of connected with that. And it instantly also connected with the neighbouring Chris Pease work in relation to being the materials of this place and being the materials of your environment in describing aspects of... Um, what this place might mean to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of those sort of processes of gathering and um, what the work, where the work might come from? Hello, everybody. My name's Lindsay Harris. I'm a Nunga from a place called Kwailin, which probably no one knows about, but it's a little ghost town now. And my painting's about the wettest part of the year when we relied on water to actually... We, there were no septic schemes, no schemes in Coilion or towards Coilion, and we had to cart our own water with a horse and cart to the local... to our tank at the house. And um, there was a big rock next to it, and the water used to run off and fill this well, which the council had dug out and made good. And then we'd put the water in the on the uh, in the 44 gallon drum on the back of the cart and the horse would take us home and we'd have water again but um, the painting itself the lines that go like that to my idea was running water off surfaces and it would run you know anywhere like to farmers dams to the nemo holes up on the rocks and to this well that was most enjoyable to have because it was clear water, not salt, it was beautiful. And uh, my work is, is it's done in hemp. I was in Margaret River one day and I saw this hemp and I bought some and I thought, well, that looks as though it could absorb stuff. So then I, um, I'm not sure if someone gave me some resin at Curtin when I was studying but I used to go out to the Mary trees and collect the uh, resin off the bark and then take it home and uh, mix it with um, methylated spirits. And then it would come out rather sticky-like. And um, I also used to use the grass tree um, resin for marking, like railway lines and stuff like that, which was much more uh, thicker. But then um, I'd put this painting or the dry pigments on a surface and put the hemp over it and then I'd um, put the whole cover it with um, the resin and then rub it in and then I'd get these uh, 
you know, images that were similar to printing, but not as as detailed as printing. But it, I always thought, well, if I make mistakes, it's not really my fault. So, <laughs> so I blame that. But that's continued up till now, and I've got colour in. That's I've used a lot of colours, and um, yeah, it's been enjoyable. But I think that's about it. Thank you. Um, the visual effect of the resin kind of becoming liquid through that, particularly that central section that feels like a well, feels like it's sort of soaking up into the hemp, um, is quite palpable. And it does bring to mind what um, water in an otherwise generally dry landscape does. It sort of, you know, finds its own path towards somewhere that um, it can then gather. Um, and yeah, I quite enjoy that work. John. Gonna, we can, yeah, we're going to have a chat about your work. Um, John's work is from a long-running series of works, paintings you've done um, on the history of ideas, which is sort of huge in itself. Like, the, there's so much in that for me. When I think about what the history of ideas might be and how um, we transcribe ideas into visual formats in art... Um, how ideas change the shape of the world or not, and how they govern how we live in the world, what, what it, how, how a thought can impact something that is physical and tangible and who we are, um, seems to be all wrapped up in the work you do. And can you talk a little bit about that? Maybe. We'll, we'll see. I'd like to say something about the chairs. Sorry about the chairs. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. <laughs> I thought for a moment we were moving into the abstract space formerly occupied by John Nixon. John was a Victorian painter who made a serious impact on abstraction. And he used the cross as a symbol and you were sitting on an abstract Nixon work if you didn't realise that you can talk about that. Um, as a former academic, I tend to talk a lot about very little and if I tend to do that this morning please throw a chair at me <laughs> but I there's one here that's unoccupied the history of ideas started in the 1990s when I left one form of practice and moved to another and I realized that I had a lot of things that I'd never spoken about publicly privately or to my, even to myself and they were all ideas, and a history of ideas seemed to be the right way to describe it. And it started then, and it's still going in a lyrical sense and in a numeric sense. I work in series, and I work precisely for myself. And many artists are selfish in that sense. They don't work for an audience, they work for themselves. And from time to time, they take their self out into the wider world. The work that's in this show is, was made in 2005 as part of a series of large works, big paintings, talking about war, bloodshed, conflict, Guantanamo Bay, heavy subjects. How do you talk about these things in an abstract sense? Because I work about things, not of them. You would recognise through history uh, the way artists talk about war, for, for example, are usually in terms of bloodthirsty paintings with firing squads, blood, death, destruction, men riding horses and waving swords. Abstraction does something else. Abstraction, for me, creates a tension or space between the surface of a work and the viewer. And what happens then in that space is beyond my ability to control as an artist and dependent seriously on your ability as a viewer to check what the dynamic between the surface of the painting and you as, a, as an observer operates. It always intrigued me before I started working in this way how apparently random marks or large masses of colour on canvas 
without meaning at all could engender such a serious emotional response from viewers. I've seen people were sitting in front of abstract paintings, crying, tears running down their face. I've seen people recoil in horror to a, from a Goya painting with real horror in it. Um, one last thing I'd like to say about Route 3 is it's the first time that I became involved with sharing my space in the studio with the work itself and the materials that they're made. The work was stretched with linear, a fra framework of um, sisal hay bale, used for binding hay bales, diagonally across the painting. And then about 30 coats of paint was applied to the surface of varying colours, finishing off with an omnipresent black. And then when I thought it would cure it and cooked long enough, we pulled the sisal off tearing its way out of the surface. And that's a completely controlled random act on behalf of the material and the medium. And it worked so well, I've been doing it ever since. That's about it. So that's, is that one the first one where you used that technique? The first series, yes. I've yeah. been working, works on paper, making drawings without actually drawing on the surface, folding the paper and then unfolding it and the fold marks became the linear drawing. And then I took that one step further, I guess, mm. into asking the, asking the paint to form a matrix on the surface. It's completely random. There's one in the Curtin University collection where we pulled the whole surface off a painting to expose the surface underneath. It's a magic space to be in. Um, so that touching on the, that what you spoke about with my experience as a viewer with the object and what's happening between the object and me um, will invariably be, there might be similarities, but you will bring yourself to each of these objects in this show and you bring your own histories with you to those objects. Um, some artists in this exhibition kind of tackled that tension in their work. So there's a Miriam Stanage painting across from John's, which is called Page, Pages of Braille, and it has um, literal pages of Braille painted within the surface, and in that Miriam's kind of moving um, a physical means of communicating information that she can't read or understand into a painted object, into a visual art form that now it's collected and in this institution can't be read because we can't touch it and we can't understand it. Um, so there's that idea of kind of pos repositioning knowledge into an abstract form um, with an understanding that we can only interpret works of art with the pre-existing experience we bring to it um, is sort of repeats over and over again in different spaces in this show. Um, Joe, we kind of touched on that a little bit before about um, when, you know, me talking to you about me, my experience of seeing your work and your experience of making it and this idea of um, being open to it just working. Like that there's this sort of something that you're doing and you're using your skills and experience with materials on one hand, but you're also sort of manoeuvring that and then at some point it's working. Um, can you talk about what that yeah, is? Yes, so well, for me, the experience of painting is... Um, it, what I love about it is that sense of mystery that you are actually having a conversation with the painting and yes, you're bringing your knowledge or your skills or some experience um, and some boundaries as well to the painting. But at some point, the painting starts to tell you what it wants to do. And that's the exciting thing that no artist can really ever talk about. Like, it's just in the doing that you have that experience. And, um, you know, it, it's really interesting being a painter. You're always poor. And you're always saying to yourself, what am I doing this for? 
you know. But ultimately, you're doing it for that moment that you have that conversation with the painting. Well, that's my experience anyway. Because it's just so incredible. And then suddenly, the painting will work. And that's the only criteria for me of a successful painting. Sometimes you go beyond that point and you kill the painting. And then you're very sad for quite a long time. But when it works, there's nothing better. You know, that, that's why I do it. And... Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful to have that experience of making. I mean, a lot of people, younger people now, don't make anything. And I find that really sad. Even if they made a cake, you know, you still have that experience of the cake working or not. But you've tried. But with a painting, it's the same. It's that precious moment when the painting tells you that it's worked. And, that's, and then it doesn't matter what happens, really. I mean... You're happy when it comes into an environment like this because hopefully other people will get something from it and it, it kind of lives on in its own world then. And, and that thing of it working, that thing of me standing in front of it and going, oh, there's something in this and I'm not sure what it is yet but I know it's there... Um, something greater than, something, than you actually endeavoured. Yeah, and so something that um, I was thinking about a lot when pulling this exhibition together was, um, you know, I sort of touched on it earlier, the many tensions around how to communicate um, these sorts of works to a public. Um, how much are you letting the work just speak for itself? How much information about where it comes from you give and being the, the subtleties of that... Um, but in each case, you know, I spoke about it before, that being with the object um, and being a, um, letting it kind of bring something out in you within a space that hopefully the works around it um, complement that or a part of that conversation, but they're not overpowering that conversation. So in the case, you know, we touched on this work being related to Joe's work in its um, relationship to mourning and water. But then on the other side of it, um, Jacob S. Capone's devotional painting, Seven Mountains and the Sea, that was made while Jacob S. was on a um, residency in Bergen in Norway. And he would walk on the peaks of the seven mountains that surround that site and gather earth and he mixed it with salt water from the ocean and made those paintings. So the only binder is the salt water. So there's, for me, it was kind of like, oh, I want to see the sparkle of that work and what that relationship between ocean and land might do with Joe's work as well. Um, and similarly, that work, when I saw it hanging in Margaret Moore's space, there was in the city, that thing of there's something in this, um, that moment of discovery is kind of present in the object. Um, Lindsay, your white earth pigment in your work, is that pigment that you gather yourself and use, or you...? A colleague at Curtin was working down at a little shop in South Fremantle, mm. and she said, this stuff might interest you, why don't you go and buy some? Yeah. And I did, and it worked with all this, you know, the colours and the... It just seemed to fit, and that's when I progressed into... Then I progressed into more colour, mm. and then they started to look good. Yeah, because there's, so, there's something kind of... It, it has that earthy feel, but when you're up close to it, it's got almost a shine to it that... Um, someone yeah, else I, told me that. Mm. A friend of mine saw that, and told my partner that there was a sparkle or something. I yeah. couldn't see it, but maybe, <laughs> maybe one. Yeah. But, but you don't, you know, if these things happen, it's all well and good mm. because that's what I think abstract's about. Mm. You know, just putting a mark down and then continuing and just carrying on. And, and the idea of experimenting... I like that too because I've got now got some jute that I'm looking at. I tried to get some jute, like old wheat bags, or yeah. but I don't think anyone's got them now. They're all mm. different, or they don't have them. Yeah. So I've just bought some new stuff and then playing around with that. Have a chat with Chris. He's 
Chris Pease's next door work, the neighbouring monochrome, um, that's made with pieced hessian. Um, as well. oh, yeah. So yeah, so quite consciously this sort of Brian Blanche flower over that way. Oh, I love is, that piece. That fantastic canopy work is made with pieced um, hessian as well. Then yours is on the hemp and then... Chris Pease's work has, is made up of pieces of um, cup hessian which have quite symbolic meanings in the work as well as um, giving a texture of something to hold on to. Um, and I guess in each of your work that um, different approaches to te achieving texture, um, that balance of thinking and process that, um, and discovery that you were sort of, you know, I don't, you didn't use the word discovery, but when you were talking about pulling the um, string out of the paint, you're controlling it, but it's also controlling it, and you're kind of finding out what happens as it happens, you know, that is this working or not working, and kind of giving over control to something that you set up. Um, is, can you tell me a little bit about what's happening in that for you, John? Gosh. Probably best to go into a... Different direction? A different direction. Okay. Um, go there. I'm currently working on Series 10, so over 30 years I've made 10 series of works, all of them somewhat related. Talking a little bit more about Root, and listening to the stories told by my colleagues, I'll tell you the story of where the image came from. It's to do with migration of re refugees, moving away from horror of some sort to find another locale or location, usually not a very successful enterprise, but I got the idea from an aerial shot I saw of migratory wildebeest on the veld in Africa. And the wildebeest run in huge mobs of wildebeest, I suppose you'd call them, all in the one direction and all in a straight line. And that's what gave me the idea. As simple as that. And ideation drives, I think, the three of us and probably every artist in this show to a greater or lesser degree. They try to engage with something external to self that will live on in a dynamic way. And you find these dynamics in various places. And uh, another little story that came to mind whilst listening to Lindsay, who I've known for a long time. I walked into my number two daughter's architect's office in Melbourne recently, and there were two Lindsay Harris paintings on the wall. I visit a friend in Coogee now in her Nouveau Mansion, and in one of the rooms there's a JT's hanging alongside a Joe Derbyshire. So in a sense you're looking at a small three-way subsection of what is increasingly a specialist marketplace. There are two exemplars I'll give of that. One is SNO, the Sydney non-objective enterprise run by Andrew Leslie, which concentrates on exclusively abstract art, and a new gallery that's open in Melbourne called Five Walls. And it's dedicated and devoted to Australian abstract art. Nothing else. And it's indicative that such a history of abstraction exists in WA. I was never really aware of the enterprise that's engaged artists in studios for so long until this show was drawn together. And I think Izzy should be congratulated for her enterprise in shifting the traditional paradigm of what abstraction is and bringing together a group of works that talk about it in many diverse ways. And in a sense that sums it up. How can there be so many diversities of nothing? Just look, I look over here, there's a pink painting and there's a blue one. They're paintings about nothing at all. What allows them to me become meaningful and dynamic for me is the space that exists between me as an observer and that which lives on the wall. And I've looked at it again and I'm now looking at a different painting even though I looked there two seconds ago. And you'll find this with abstraction when and if you ever come to terms with it and you must because you're here today. Every time you look at an abstraction, 
it's different to the time you looked at it before. Now the same cannot be said for realist art. Sheep in a paddock under a gum tree bleating positively. You look at a hyson and you'll always only ever see a hyson. You look at some of these things and you'll see something new every time. It makes for dynamic urban and suburban space. You can do things in your house that you never really dreamed of but just by putting a painting into it. That's it. That was fantastic. <laughs> how, do you, how do you follow that? Um, but that hits the... I will say something. <laughs> okay. Again. <laughs> Remember, I warned you, you should throw a chair. <laughs> I had a show in 2017 at PSAS in Fremantle. And we drew together, it was called Remnants, and it was bits and pieces from here, there and everywhere. And at the end of that show, I realised... And talking to Annette, we realised singularly and conjointly that I had no artwork left at all that I had made. There was absolutely nothing in my studio. There were some bits and pieces from early ceramic practice, but nothing from my history of ideas. So I started work again in 2017. And I've worked through three shows and there's a show in Melbourne later this year. But it's magic space to be part of and a privilege to be there, I think. That PSAS show I remember seeing and if any of you have been into that um, gallery that is a warehouse, um, it is a challenging space for artists to occupy and I'm going to fan out a little bit here but it was kind of the first time I went in there and went, oh, he understood how to use this space. It was fantastic use of that space, that show. Um, and it kind of refocused me on the work that you do. I kind of went, oh, okay, what's actually going on here? Because it was an, uh, not just the paintings, but your understanding of how paintings sit in the world and how they change based on different spaces they might occupy. Um, John mentioned briefly Andrew Leslie, whose um, painting is behind you all on the black stripes on the wall that are emitting a beautiful reflection of blue and yellow. And um, that was a work that um, we borrowed from the John Curtin Gallery. They generously lent it to us for this show. And I'd seen Andrew's work, I think, in a Goddard de Fittis exhibition maybe at some point. So I was familiar with the tactics that he used around um, ref using reflection and kind of prompting us to think about where paintings might begin and end um, and where the art experience be begins and end because that, the colour happening of that work, you are not seeing on the surface of the object, you're seeing around the object. And so he's kind of prompting us to think about where is it, how far out is it coming to and what, what is um, our relationship to the art in this space that we're occupying. And in a different way, John's work does a similar thing with those diagonal lines of uh, potential migration to some optimistic future place um, spread out in equal lines uh, as though they continue off the edge of the canvas, as though the ideas that are in that work continue beyond the boundary of the work. Um, and I think that's what, you know, that idea of our engagement with the object and what it's doing in the space between us and it is um, quite a uh, pleasurable space to occupy and one of the reasons I um, love doing the work that I do. Um, how are we going for time? We're going pretty good for time. Does anyone out there have questions that they might want to ask of our artists or myself. I'm happy to pass the mic around. I've got one back there. I'll come over with the mic. Just got a question to you, Isabel. Um, how is the show curated or hung, uh, grouped together, and would that po possibly explain a little bit about the reason for the show? Yeah, okay. Uh, that's a really... Uh, summing this show up in a short... Um, way is actually really challenging and it's been a challenge for the duration of developing this exhibition. 
Um, the idea of it came about about two years ago when um, my colleague Robert Cook and I were talking about a number of si significant West Australian artists who work in the field of abstraction who we might want to do a survey exhibition of. And we went, oh, well, there's sort of too many. And if we did a this artist show and then a that artist show and then a that artist show, and, it, you know, we'd, we'd still be trying to get through it in 20 years' time. Um, so let's begin by looking at um, what's happening in that space of abstraction in Western Australia. And um, we thought about, you know, you start with a list of... Um, I don't want to say usual suspects, but the people that you might, if you're familiar with abstract art in Western Australia, you're going to immediately think of Trevor Vickers and Trevor Richards and Jeremy Cohen Ward and Helen Smith and a few particular names that their work is incredible and um, they occupy space here in such a powerful way. Um, but I was interested in sort of every time I pulled a thread of looking at one artist, I was thinking of someone else, it sort of sprung to mind a work that seemed to have a relationship to it, either visually or through art history. So, you know, for example, in this space, um, John spoke about, oh, a pink painting over there that's kind of about nothing but is different every time we look at it. Um, and it is different every time we look at it. And it has this sort of visual relationship with what's happening around it, but it has an art history relationship in terms of this place as well. So um, George Haynes's work here, which was a 1970 work. Uh, Jeremy Cohen Ward and Giles Honan's works are 1971, and Carol Rudyard's a 1969 work. Carol, Giles and Jeremy were students of George. And these two works here were exhibited in their first exhibition from um, graduating art school at Waite in 1971. And the work on the right by Jeremy was acquired by Agua in the year it was made in 71. And we borrowed the pink work from the Holmes Accord collection. Um, and Carol's incredible work was actually made while she was still a student, which is kind of unbelievable given um, how commanding that is. So you kind of have that, I wanted that opportunity in this exhibition to talk about those little pockets of social, like local history, but how they also might relate to the world of abstraction more broadly. And you get to do that through this work, being having a relationship to Rothko because this is who this artist is out looking to. Um, and then you kind of go along, you know, into curatorially, I kind of selfishly wanted to see the Shane Pickett, Hot Bunaru and Twisting Breeze painting over there, which was lent to us from the City of Perth art collection. Um, because I used to be a curator at that collection and I acquired that work for that collection and I wanted to see it next to Carol's work. I wanted to see it in this space. We have incredible works by Shane in this collection, but for this show, that was the work that made sense within this environment of talking about abstraction in Western Australia. Um, so that's kind of a little tiny pocket of what's happening across the gallery space. Um, I wrote section texts and didactics and I thought about putting this exhibition in terms of these are the artists who are being expressionist and these are the artists who are being pure abstraction and the, you know, like I sort of 20 different versions of what this exhibition might look like exist in my computer archive. Um, but it really came together when I let all of that go because if you try and think about, well, this artist fits into this pocket, but they also don't because they're also doing 10 other things at the same time. And um, so the approach to how it plays out in this exhibition space became more about the feel of what is the object doing in relation to its neighbour, as well as the relationship between the work and those around it. So it sort of became a blend of those things. Um, and we abandoned having section texts that tell you about the history of abstraction as this broader idea, um, because it seemed to 
pull audiences out of the experience with the work. Um, so the labels were written uh, kind of with an intention that someone who's, so my 15-year-old teenager could understand the content within that label, but hopefully there's enough kind of engaging information in there for audiences from lots of different backgrounds as well. And they were also written so that if someone, some mad person, <laughs> had the energy to read all of them, they could kind of find the links between those works. But you could also just kind of dip in and out of one or two of them and still kind of, it, they can stand alone as their own um, small piece of text. So I hope, did that answer a little bit about it? <laughs> okay. Um, any, yep. Yeah? Just the creative act in terms of facing maybe a, a, a blank piece of um, screen and then actually coming to an, in, an intention. I think intention was the horrors of often society or the death or actually the value of water in a remote area. But the question I have is that creative act between wanting to uh, communicate um, and the actual act of creativity in having that then represented on a, a painting or whatever form of medium. I can only relate it in terms of architecture, that an architect is presented with a, a puzzle or a, a requirement, and then the, the actual creative act is to come up with a physical form that is going to be built into a particular building. I have difficulty in terms of um, a per being faced with a work as to what was the creative act that the artist is bringing to me in terms of the image that's been created. So, my question is directly related to the creative act of the artist. Okay, who's going to answer that? <laughs> um, I'll start with a little bit. It's probably not possible to answer the question. Uh, drawing an analogy between an artist and an architect is difficult in the sense that always at the end of an architect's endeavour there will be something that you can touch and reel and live in or be fit for purpose. An artist, if he or she is working in the right possible and extending the possibilities, will always produce something that is fit for purpose and that is to make a reflection on his or her thought processes at the time of making and then there's that ineffable act of inviting an audience to view the work and there's no way that that can be measured in any concrete way if you like it's we have nearly 50 people in the room here there are 50 ways of looking at what I'm saying at the moment and trying to listen to that the creativity of my answer to you will be measured in different ways by 50 different people. It's very rarely that they will look at something and see the same thing. Whereas if you look at a building, you'll always see a building. One is not more or less creative than the other and both are essential to the well-being of our culture such as it is. Can I just add that the creative act that I think you're imagining is maybe not always how you think it is. Like, I think 90% of it is just turning up in the studio <laughs> and uh, going, I'm going to make something. And then there's also a lot of mess involved. So, and there's also an act of destruction involved, I think, to making, to making art. So it's very complex. I think every artist has a different way of working, but we all have to... Even, I think, writers exemplify this. They have to make themselves sit down at the typewriter or sit down to actually do something. So it's an intent to be present, an intent to be creative, and hopefully you do something. Some days you don't. It's very difficult to pinpoint it. What do you think, Lindsay? Yeah, well, I've got a piece of jute on a platform at the moment, and I left it out last night 
and I didn't realise it was going to rain, so hopefully something else will come out of it. So, <laughs> so but whether the, you know, you, some of these things happen by mistake. They're not, they're not planned. I mean, my, the artist I enjoyed was Modrian, when he moved from landscapes and stuff like that to just those red, black and all the primary colours and white and black. And how he made that move in that period of time, I don't know, because he would have had so much opposition to that work that would have just about driven me mad. But he did it and he did it well. And, you know, the way they come up with all these ideas is unbelievable. You know, what's going through the man's mind is incredible. Hi, everybody. Um, I think everybody would agree that uh, it's been fascinating listening to you. Um, so if we kidnap you <laughs> to, to talk to you, that'd be great. But um, I just wanted to ask, to what extent do you use your intuition? Because I think you're right that, you know, 90% of anything is literally showing up and doing something because something is always better than nothing. But... How, to what extent do you rely on your intuition? A hundred percent. So, so it's fair to say that you, you, you have no preconceived ideas when you go in? It, it... Well, I often have an idea and uh, I will start with that. But if the painting goes in a different direction or a better direction, like I actually see that the paintings, the mistake that's happened or the process that has, been, has created an effect has worked better, then I'll go in that direction. So I might have an idea, but I don't have to impose that upon the painting. It's just somewhere to start and hope. And if it works out that that idea is exemplified, then which I think it has in that one, then I'm thrilled. But I don't think you ever really, you know, I mean, you make a lot of paintings or a lot of work and it's not always you know it's not always brilliant work and you can't expect that from yourself but you can't judge it either I've got a whole room in my house full of paintings that haven't been sold I'm thinking about the skip bin <laughs> but you know you can work over them and stuff like that so you know <laughs> so, so how does your how would you describe your intuition you know what colour is it? What does it feel like? How would you describe your, your personal intuition? How does it, how does it feel? What colour is it? Does it come in different strengths? Does it go up and down? How can, do you, can you describe your intuition? Um, yeah, let's go for a glass of wine after. <laughs> no, for instance, I, I, I am an artist, you know, I'm, I, I'm, you know just as a, as a hobby. Um, and I find that it's really annoying, you know, if I go to bed late at midnight and I have an idea pop into my head and I'm like, I am so not going to remember this in the morning. So I have to get up, go downstairs, voice record it, do a couple of sketches, you know, whatever. And like, for me, it's, you know, like nothing, nothing, nothing. Super busy. And I'm like, oh, shit, I, think I haven't got enough I think there's a difference there between them. having an idea, which I th certainly do in the middle of the night too, to actually um, intuition. So, yes, having the idea, I remember it, I write it down, I, I put it in the visual diary, I think about it. But when you actually come to making the work, then your intuition is very different about whether it's working or not, whether to just destroy it or paint over it or just jettison that idea and go with something else. So I think there's two different things you're talking about. A similar... Um intuitions happen in a curatorial space as well. So in terms of um, there were quite a few moments in developing this show where with my colleagues it was kind of, they were like, so you're telling me we just have to trust you? And I was like, yes, you just have to trust me. Because I could see things in relationships between works that um, I could, I could, kind of put on these walls and kind of make links with and they made sense for me. Um, but it was actually quite hard to put words to. 
And yes, as curators, we put words to things and we describe what's happening in works of art. But with abstraction, quite often that putting words to something kind of pulls you out of the what's happening. Um, so the experience of being with the object um, can guide where that object goes. So um, a great example of that was the Galliano Fardin painting down the end, which is the... Um, looks almost rainbowish from here, but it's essentially red and blue and yellow stripes with an angle kind of down the bottom. And around the corner from that is the beautiful uh, Mr. Mac uh, Millstream Tablelands painting. And when I saw Galliano's painting, I instantly thought of Mr. Mac's painting. And I was really fortunate that they were hanging... Um, on painting racks where I could pull them both out and sort of stand in between them in our collection store and think about the flickering tactics that sort of they're both using where um, you end up with this mesmerising quality of different colours of paint playing next to each other in these rippling lines. And it was an intuition that was... I, these have a relationship with one another that isn't necessarily... Um, coming from the pl same source, but they are speaking about the light of, and the materiality of this land and what it is to be in this space in Western Australia, in different parts of Western Australia. Galliano's down in the southwest. Um, but when I tried how they might operate next to each other, it was too much. And the Mac work needed to occupy its own space and kind of also have a relationship with Sheena McPherson's rainbow paintings, um, which are across from it, and with John's painting around the corner where you've got these, you know, coloured lines coming through it. Um, to describe where that comes from, I mean, part of it is the knowledge of the history of these objects and reading, you know, a hundred different artist files and where all of these works have come from. But essentially, it is standing between two artworks and going, there's something in this, and I want to see them in this space, and I want other people to have their encounter with them in this space as well. Can I just say that that's what it, that is one of the fantastic things about this exhibition, is that it doesn't look like it's been made by a, a committee. It looks like it's been made by some, you know, it's been curated and put together by someone who has looked, who has a heart, who has their own vision, and they've been allowed to do it. It hasn't been interfered with by political correctness or who should be in this and who shouldn't be in this, and I'm sure those discussions have happened, but at some level, the curator has worked with her intuition in a way that has made the works as a whole a beautiful exhibition, and that's, that's what I'm honoured to be in. I'm honoured to be in an exhibition where that has happened, not to be included in something... You know, often exhibitions are quite dry, you know, and there's, but the, in this case, the curator's vision has made it glow, I think. So I, Thanks, I think that Joe. intuition is, it's not just a compliment. I really, I really think Thank that you. works. I think other people might agree. You know, and you've included works that are not historically been included in these exhibitions about abstraction and lots of more, lot more women's work, <laughs> sorry. There's a lot more women's work in the show you know, someone like Teela George's work, which is embroidery, uh, Jane, the work... Jane Whiteley's Jane work. Jane Whiteley's work. I mean, we were... We, as artists, they were around in the 70s, but they weren't included in this idea of an abstract show. And I think that you've opened it up, made it more diverse and, you know, made connections between people that haven't been made before. So good on you. Thank Fantastic. you, Joe. Yes, I'd like to reinforce that, I guess. And as we're moving towards the end, I'd also like to encourage Lindsay not to clean the room out. He may have the best collection of Lindsay Harris artwork in Australia. <laughs> as he should as an artist. But I do reinforce Joe's commentary about the curation of this show. I think it's been... I'm searching for the right word. I'm going to say visionary. So I'll leave it at that. Well done. Thank you. One more.
Can I just round that up and say, instead of it being um, based solely on um, your intuition, which is something um, that is um, without education and without experience, that it's a learned intuition from your experience of creating or curating, as opposed to something innocent and un uneducated. So, it, but that's a beautiful way to experience it, but... I think there's more to the intuition rather than... I think there's definitely experience, yeah. you know, and that, that experience comes from a lot many years of, of working in the area. That's true. But also there's, a, there's some kind of individual intuition that I think you, you need to encourage in children, you need to encourage in, in everybody. And that is the unique thing... Uh, if Isabel had to write an essay about what she was going to put in this show, it, she couldn't because a lot of these connections are only going to be made when you, when you install. And as artists, that's part of... If you install your own show, if it's an artist-installed show, it's actually amazing because a lot of those decisions are made at the last minute when you're doing the install. Oh, no, that looks better there. Oh, no, we need to put that one there. You know, you just it's just a bad experience, as you say, but it's about believing in your instinct... And I don't know how you actually explain what that is. It's something mysterious. It is a balance because there is um, kind of this huge meandering one-note notebook in my computer full of every artist in this show and more with scans from our artist files of where these works are from and statements and texts written by... Bromfield and John Barrett Leonard and these ideas of what West Australian art history is and all of these things and different positions. So all of that is in there. But it is coupled with what's happening when I'm with this object. And the what's happening when I'm with this object was more important to me than including a work that um, didn't have that thing. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, these are all my favourites, these are all the things I love. Um, I learnt very early on in um, curating and working with collections that collections are not about me and they're not about my personal interest in a work. They're about something kind of bigger than that. So I take that mind with me to the object. Um, and, of course, there's a lot of things in here I really love. But um, it, it is sort of from a space that's outside of that. It's not about... Um, it's both personal and also not at the same time. Mm. I think... Shall we end on that? We're good? Yeah. <laughs>